Welcome back, everybody, to Cult Pop. I'm sorry it's been so long. It's been a couple years. COVID happened. Life happened. But here we are, and there's some great news. We're in a beautiful new studio in Trenton, Michigan. We're going to start pumping out shows. And for today's show, we've got a great guest, a previous guest. John Snyder has been on the show before. You folks loved it. We're pleased to have him on. He's visiting Michigan, and he's uh, agreed to be on the show again. Uh, John's a very famous artist, has been working in, in the comic book industry and book industry for years. Amazing work, and we're just thrilled to death to have you on here today, John. Thanks so much for being on the show. Well, thanks, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, there's so much to talk about that we're just going to jump in straight away so we can get to all the different things I want to talk about. And I first wanted to talk about, we both have a love for the mystery writer Lawrence Block. Yes. And you have very recently had the opportunity to... Uh, strike up relationship, uh, business and friendship with him, and you have adapted in a graphic novel format, Eight Million Ways to Die, mm -hmm. and taken a, a classic work and added your own spark to it. So I'd like you to kind of tell us a little bit about the process and, and tell us a little bit for folks not uh, familiar with the character or Lawrence Block, oh, I see. exactly what it is. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Lawrence Block's a uh, world-renowned writer, and uh, he's known for a number of different characters. Uh, uh, in the uh, mystery genre, uh, uh, he is, uh, uh, the character here is Matthew Scudder, Detective Matthew Scudder, and uh, he's the series, uh, uh, he's been featured in a series of short stories, uh, I, uh, a, number of, uh, a number of novels, about 18, uh, 17, and a novella, I believe, and uh, this book in particular is the fifth in the series, Eight Million Ways to Die, and uh, the character actually ages in real time. So this book was uh, published in, uh, the original novel was published in 1982. And so uh, for the adaptation, I kept that 1982 setting. Uh, and it was really an honor to have this opportunity uh, to adapt this, uh, this. This is a very famous novel. Uh, it's, a, it's a landmark book in the mystery genre. And uh, it's a terrific book that deals with uh, a whole lot of different things. I, 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 it deals with, you know, the human condition. Uh, you know, it's a thriller, it's a detective story, but it's a whole lot of different things. And I found it to be a, uh, a really rewarding and challenging in the best po of possible ways project. Uh, and I was really grateful to uh, Lawrence and, uh, and uh, uh, the guys at IDW for okay. offering me the opportunity uh, to be able to adapt this. I had a great editor, Tom Waltz, and uh, all the, the whole thing in general was uh, uh, a pleasure to work on. Now, it received rave reviews. It's still out and available to be published at your local bookstores, Barnes & Noble, online. So I want people to go out there and grab it. But it's really amazing because you, you keep the core, the novel intact, and you add some of your own life to it, specifically with the art and the vibrant New York City. You bring life to New York City, not only through his words, your words, and it's absolutely beautiful. Can you talk about, th this is a, a work of love that you've done. This, the, the artwork is amazing, the story's amazing, Scudder comes to life on the pages. Talk, talk a little bit about you know, the process of, of bringing him to life on the page. Well, uh, you know, uh, Lawrence, uh, in his writing, uh, he's very descriptive in terms of the locales uh, that Scudder and the characters uh, travel through within New York City. And, uh, and it's been said before in uh, uh, analysis of the book and, and in general, and, and Lawrence has even said himself, that New York itself is, is a character of the story. Uh, in the story and, and in the Scudder series in general. And I've always had a love for New York myself and, and this particular period, the late 70s, early 80s, um, is very uh, near and dear to me personally because growing up uh, I was living in the D.C. area and I was always fascinated by New York uh, during that period. Uh, my first time up in New York was, was actually uh, the uh, uh, summer of 1981. And uh, so that, so I had a vivid memory, I have a vivid memory of this general period, uh, as brief as it was. But, uh, you know, I, th I saw this as a great opportunity to kind of incorporate my love of the city. And also, frankly, when I was living in, uh, growing up in, in uh, the downtown D.C. area uh, and, and spent time around there, kind of integrating some of my thoughts of what it was like to uh, be in the city and, and put all that together. 
uh, in this book. I also, you know, the period, the movies from that period, like Mean Street, Scorsese's Mean Streets, and and Taxi Driver, and uh, oh, just a whole slew of other films. Uh, you know, again, that that not so much the content as the look of the city. I would try to uh, I try to incorporate, you know, visually. Uh, in, in the adaptation. Now, as the people at home see some of the images, could you talk about, I think a lot of people, uh, the comic book uh, stereotype is long gone. People know about graphic novels and how these, these are many mm -hmm. adult-oriented things. But I think people are going to look at this and say, boy, this isn't your, uh, your dad's comic book. This is, an arch this is, this is uh, museum art quality inside oh, thank here. You. And could you kind of talk about, as people are seeing some of the pages on screen, uh, tell me how long it takes to produce a page like this well, and, and it, some it, of the processes it varies, going it in. It varies, and, and uh, the production stage in a project like this uh, goes on different levels. Uh, the first being the actual literal adaptation of uh, working with the original novel, you know, the manuscript, and, and translating that and uh, doing the layouts to fit within the all allocated, it was, we had about 130 pages or so for this book for how to fit you know, the novel and, and the whole process of adaptation, uh, which, uh, is, uh, which is, again, it's a, it's a challenge, but it's a great challenge, especially when you're working with this brilliantly w written work with you know, this fantastic dialogue. So you know, a lot of ways uh, in structuring the, the layout of the book, you know, I want to present the characters in a way to kind of um, to kind of enhance the dialogue. So you know, it's 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 a matter of balancing, you know, uh, a, a interaction between two characters and and you know, how am I going to put them in the panel to get the most dramatic effect? What kind of emotional quality do they have on the? You know, it's almost like mm -hmm. you're acting. Absolutely. You know, through the artwork because you know you want to pay attention to what the characters are saying. What are they doing in that scene? Now, since it's not live action and it's you know it's a still image, um, you know you want to be able to convey an emotional quality to it that you don't necessarily do in the facial expressions because you have a limited amount of space to work with and you can't have close-ups on every single panel because you have to show like location and such. Mm -hmm. So you want to get into arranging uh, the characters in, in, a, in a scene where it also works into the characters. So you have them in, way in the background, you know, some in the foreground, you know, overhead shots, that sort of thing. Uh, so the whole thing is kind of a little bit of a balancing act. Um, also, with something like this, uh, you know, because it's a hardback, because it's a graphic novel, and it's something that, you know, is a lot more expensive than the old comics right, were. absolutely. I try to in this case, and in any case, when I work on a graphic novel, I try to make it worth the investment people put into buying it. And I like to give them something that will take some time to read. And, uh, and that was my attitude with this book. So I kind of had a, uh, a format where you would have the, the traditional panel-to-panel, real-time you know, activity going on between the characters, but I would also do pages where it was almost a full-page sh shot of a full figure and inset panels of people talking, and then like lines of dialogue running running concurrent to like the figure, mm -hmm. and that was something that you would almost read like a semi novel, like a, mm -hmm. like an illustrated book, and that was kind of a way to break up, you know, the and and to add like a, a time level to you know the progression of time in the story and such. So the general effect was was to create a, a kind of a whole new, a whole new kind of rhythm to the traditional comic book. Uh, you know, pacing where it's 20 pages and it's over. This, you know, it, it, this is more like, you know, if it takes you one or two days to read, you know, that's great. Right. But sure. I've, I've had a numerous people tell me they opened it up and started and couldn't stop and mm -hmm. just yeah, read to the night. I absolutely <laughs> loved it. And, you know, I'm a, a big fan of uh, Mr. Block's work. And I love his novels. And I love that you kind of made this your own with the uh, it, it, absolutely beautiful job. And I want to remind people that it's Eight Million Ways to Die by Lawrence Block. It's still available, all your bookstores, Amazon, whoever you choose to go through. And it's uh, IDW. They do a beautiful job. It's uh, packaged incredibly. So I, I recommend you go and, and pick this up. But keeping with the character of Matthew Scudder, you loaned your wonderful work and you did some beautiful work for The Night in the Music, a collection of short stories for the Matthew Scudder character by Lawrence Block. 
by Subterranean Press, and they do right. beautiful work. And you did this incredible cover, and then you did an incredible uh, plate inside the, the the book plate. And just talk a little bit about continuing the love of the character, and and this is a magnificent cover. Oh, I absolutely thank you, love thanks. That. Yeah, there was well, it was really an honor that. Uh, Lawrence had requested uh, that I be involved with uh, this newest collection of, of the uh, Matthews. It's a collection of the Matthew Scudder short stories that had appeared in various publications uh, throughout the year. So once again, you know, it's, it's following Matthew Scudder in New York through different time periods, 70s, 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, et cetera. And um, uh, they asked me to uh, do the cover for this. And I was, you know, real excited about uh, getting involved with the Scudder character again. Uh, Lawrence and I have a continuing discussion, and we're both very open to continue doing more uh, Matthew Scudder graphic novels. And we've discussed this at length, and, and maybe someday in the future, we'll be revisiting Scudder in graphic novel form. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it was wonderful to have this opportunity to do this cover. Fantastic. And it was great to work with Subterranean Press. As you said, they do a beautiful job. Uh, the printing's great. It's a, it's a great group to be involved with. And it was really nice to, and an honor to be on board. Fantastic. Congratulations. Beautiful book. Thank you. Again, that's through Subterranean Press, The Night and the Music, uh, Lawrence Block. I recommend you track that down. That's available right now. Uh, I want to switch gears and talk about one of your... Uh, one of your babies, if you will, uh, something going back from the early days that's recently been recollected, some of my, my favorite work of yours, and it was uh, ahead of its time and now being rediscovered because of a collection. And I know there's plans that you, you might want to be doing stuff in the future you may not be able to talk about now, but there is a wonderful collection out of fashion and action mm -hmm. and an absolutely incredible series, years ahead of its time, and now just gaining all kinds of new fans with this new collection. Talk to folks at home about what Fashion in Action is. Okay, well, uh, Fashion in Action is a uh, series that uh, I created back in uh, the mid '80s, and it involved a um, involved a celebrity protection agency in 2086 uh, that was headed by uh, CEO Francis Knight, uh, who is a world traveling uh, entrepreneur that decided to start uh, the world's uh, most fabulous uh, celebrity protection agency. <laughs> And um, it's a, you know, it's kind of a, a, a mix of a, of a lot of different things that I love, like uh, 60s spy fi, I guess is one way to put it. And at that time, when I first developed the series, my love of uh, the new music that was coming out during that period uh, from the early 80s on up. Uh, but it is basically, you know, my adventure strip, you know, my, you know, that, that I wanted to do with, uh, that has a lot of different world locations. Uh, locations around the world uh, that's kind of jet setting and I really want to kind of work in that uh, even with the celebrity angle that uh, that it actually ends up that they get involved in all these world saving adventures so these things start out small and then develop into these bigger and bigger adventures but uh, but I actually had an undercurrent that I wanted to get into it too of uh, of individuality uh, for the characters and um, and it's something that's very near and dear to me so uh, I, uh, like, I, it was originally appeared as a backup series in um, uh, Timothy Truman's Scout comic, and uh, that was one concurrent story that was collected, and then I did a few specials afterwards. And like, like you had said, I had recently had the opportunity to um, restore the original colors and artwork, and, and uh, you know, using our technology today, was able to put together a really nice uh, collection. So it's all out there, and it's great, and it's currently available on uh, Comixology, actually. Uh, I'd like to talk about, we had some real interesting discussions as that process was going on about how you brighten up and, and, and rework art that might be 20 years old, 30 years old. Talk a little bit, I think it's a very interesting process and, mm -hmm. and things that go on, because that's happening a lot now, that we're, we're taking some old classics and brightening them up, fixing up a little bit. Talk about some of that process. Of well, it's uh, it's funny because, uh, you know, when I first worked on this series back in the mid-'80s, this was for Eclipse Comics, and I was working with uh, Cat Ironwood and Dean Mullaney. And uh, they were very, uh, uh, this was a very big period of the beginning of independent comics. Uh, you had Dave Stevens with The Rocketeer. Uh, uh, all, si all kinds of great things were coming out of that period. And... Um, the, the the point is is that they were very uh, they were very serious about uh, giving artists 
uh, their rights, you know, in terms of, you know, giving you control of your character, that you had the rights to the character. Uh, but in addition to that, they always made sure that you got your artwork returned, which had actually been an issue, uh, sure. really, well, that would, for years was only resolved yeah. uh, only recently at that mm -hmm. point, you know, with all the, a lot of different companies. So, so I had all the artwork returned, and in addition, I did all the color work, and that was done on uh, the, what they called gray lines at that time, which was you would get a film positive that was the size of the actual printed page of the artwork, and then you would have a gray line reproduction, and you would color on the gray line reproduction. Well, uh, through the years, I had kept all these materials. Okay. And so, and I actually always had made uh, black and white copies of all the line art. So I had, uh, you know, all these resources, and with today's technology, like I said, in Photoshop, I was able to scan uh, all these different elements. And, you know, sometimes uh, there would be some aging in some of the original art. Sometimes uh, some of the colors had kind of faded a bit. Sure. Um, so I was able to actually, you know, piece together using all these different elements. And uh, when I did fashion in action, I was using a lot of flat color. I was actually using cell paint, animation cell paint, to do some of the uh, work on the gray lines. So I was working in a lot of flat tones as opposed to a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of modeling and shading that's done in computer coloring mm -hmm. now. But I had more of, what, of, a, of a flat color look at that point. So it was actually very easy, well, not so much easy, but it was not as complex in terms of the shading and such to restore the original kind of vibrancy, you know, of the, of the uh, original color. Sure. So it, it gets to be a very meticulous process, but, uh, but I've, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, and, and I was really happy with the final result, and I think it came out uh, really, I was very, very happy with how it came out, and I've had a lot of people tell me that the work still looks very uh, contemporary, and I, that's really a nice thing to hear. So. Fantastic, and I, for one, am looking forward to whatever direction you look to take the characters yeah, in the future. Yeah, I'm not done with fashion and action. Yep. There's more to come. And uh, more, we'll have more details on that in a future uh, episode. A future episode. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Want to switch gears again? Uh, a lot of people in the press are seeing a lot of talk about a work that uh, uh, you were a part of, and that's the comic Grendel. Mm -hmm. And Grendel has uh, some recently been collected by Dark Horse, right? And uh, omnibus editions of all the work, and, and you're one of a bunch of artists and writers that have uh, had a wonderful opportunity to jump into that world. And, and create wonderful characters. So I'd like you to talk about your run on the comic book Grendel. Well, uh, uh, getting back to that period again, I was mentioning Dave Stevens' Rocketeer, another, another real vanguard of that early period of, uh, of kind of this, this explosion of independent creator-owned comics was uh, uh, Matt Wagner's Grendel, which was at Kamiko at that time. And uh, the initial, uh, the initial uh, run of Grendel featured a character, Hunter Rose. And uh, and then what? Ha and then there was a character. Then he was actually he actually died at the end of uh, Matt's initial run with that character. And then he introduced an another Grendel, uh, Christine Spar. And uh, at the time, I had just wrapped up my work on fashion and action. And uh, Diana Schutz, who was the editor uh, at, on Grendel at the time, uh, had asked me if I'd be interested in being involved in Grendel. And I thought, well, that must be because I'm doing fashion and action and Francis Knight, and you know, this is a strong female character, and there's this, this Christine Spark, and it was a, a beautifully done. Uh, the book was beautifully done. Again, had that kind of new music style by the Panda Brothers uh, and Jay Geldof, and I just thought, oh, this 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 is going to work. And I remember the first time I talked to Matt. I was talking about, so I guess I'll be continuing the adventures of Christine Spar. And he said, no, she gets killed off. Uh -huh. And I was just shocked because I thought, well, this is, is I mean, what's going to happen, right? Uh -huh. But at the same time, it really kind of endeared me to Matt right away because I was like, this guy takes chances and this is great. You know, I, I have no idea what we're going to do. Um, so what I had learned is, is that Grendel is kind of almost like a spirit that goes from one character to the next. And actually... Uh, the run with Christine Spar was followed by a, a short run with uh, a cartoonist, uh, uh, illustrator, writer Bernie Moreau, who's a brilliant, who's done brilliant Absolutely. work. Absolutely, yes. And uh, and then uh, I believe uh, Tim Sale uh, might have done somebody else, uh, another writer, done like one or two in mm -hmm. between. And then our run was going to kick in, and that was the Epi Thatcher run, which was set 
way in the future and this completely dystopian universe. And, and uh, you know, we, that's where we introduced, you know, the Epi Thatcher character. Mm. And that was a whole different world, you know, that was completely miles away, uh, worlds away rather, from, you know, Christine Spar. So it was really an exciting and, and uh, a real joy to work on. Uh, Grendel's a, a great work. I, I really recommend folks uh, track down the uh, Dark Horse collections, the omnibus collections that make it very easy to catch up to the stories. And John's work is in the Omnibus Volume 3 collection from Dark Horse. And I think uh, I recommend getting all four and just having a, a month or two of some fantastic reading. It's, uh, it's great stuff. Uh, John, I, I wanted to talk about um, you and Matt are friends. You, you, uh, so we've seen you working with uh, him over the years, uh, people say, oh, I saw your friend did this cover and that cover and this cover. If you would, if you can talk about uh, being a, a 20 plus, 30 plus year comic book professional, the joys and challenges of, well, they know you from this comic, but oh, now you're on this comic. <laughs> be, because you're, you're always uh, popping up here or there, you, you might be doing covers. You're known for beautiful, uh, full, you're known for beautiful art and incredible cards and, and uh, museum quality uh, product when it's all said and done for cards, covers, things of that nature. And so people really get to know you from, oh, John Snyder's on the show, oh, he did this, he's done my, my favorite interpretation of this character or that character. So, so talk about how uh, through the years you, you've had your art marked onto so many different characters over the years. Well, uh, you know, I, I always wanted to keep moving <laughs> and uh, and, uh, you know, I always liked the, I always had an idea that I wanted to draw as many different characters as possible. And, uh, uh, you know, and I was, you know, to, for me personally, uh, I enjoyed doing things like single illustrations, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working on, you know, uh, uh, you know, like a, a gallery piece or a cover or, uh, you know, even when the trading card thing was popular, uh, trading cards. And it was always, uh, I always had a, uh, uh, always got a big thrill out of doing these various characters that I either personally had known from, from the past. Uh, uh, for instance, I, I did a uh, Johnny Quest gallery piece right. for, for uh, Kamiko back when they had the license and Johnny Quest was a personal favorite from my childhood. So that was a joy. And then, and then a few years later, uh, Dark Horse uh, had done, uh, was doing adaptation of the animated series that came out in the 90s, and I did a few covers for those. Um, so that kind of thing was was a lot of fun, and uh, also to be involved in projects that were more current, like um, I did a Alien trading card for, uh, uh, and worked on an Alien project. Again, it was just, you know, a single illustration or a one page in a, in a like a jam project with other right. artists and writers uh, for Dark Horse as well. But I always liked that challenge of kind of hopping and, and getting into showing that you know, I would do all these different, I could, was, you know, able to draw all these different type of characters. And it, it was always very interesting for me. Now, what's interesting about jumping around like that is, is that um, as much as I enjoyed it, and there would be people that would follow my work, a lot of people weren't aware that it was one guy that was doing all these exactly. different drawings. Exactly, that's what know? I was going to get to. And that wasn't, yeah. quite, wasn't, yeah. wasn't quite apparent to me. But what's been really nice about again, our, our modern day is, is uh, I had kept files of the images and such. And as I, uh, you know, get involved as we all do in social media now with, you know, Instagram and websites and all that sort of thing. And I post my work, uh, you know, I'm able to show, you know, all these different projects I worked on. And I have a lot of people that are like, I didn't know that you were the same guy. Right, that did, that's you know, the, the comments the, I get the, quite you know, a bit. I didn't know you did this right. Venom piece. I didn't know right. you did this Max piece. Right. I didn't know you you were the guy or, that did the Spawn piece. You're the Suicide Squad artist. <laughs> right. And now you've revisited Suicide. I right. find it very interesting that so many of your projects from different eras are all becoming important now. Uh, so well, we're talking about fashion <laughs> and action, the female apartment. Grendel. Uh, uh, Lawrence Block, Suicide Squad. You did a fantastic run in the past mm -hmm. that is loved, and now you've been doing a uh, some covers because of the movie release. You did some incredible covers for DC. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about that. Well, some people, that's, oh, that's that was same. fun. That was yeah. really fun because uh, my first job at DC Comics was uh, my first job was on Suicide Squad, and I started work that uh, first started coming out in 1989, and uh, uh, that was after actually after I'd finished working on Grendel. John Ostrander, uh, the writer, John Ostrander and Kim Yale, the writers of that time, had asked me if I'd be interested in working on Suicide Squad, uh, which was, you know, a really fun, offbeat comic. I was not really what you would call 
a traditional superhero artist at all, but John was not your traditional comic book uh, superhero writer either. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, he brought this, you know, the whole concept of it, of these misfit villains, you know, that were, that would get knocked off, you know, uh, and you never knew what was going to happen from one issue to the next, was great fun to work on. And uh, it's really interesting because uh, it, was, it was such a misfit group, and it was kind of a yeah. misfit comic, right. you know. And so it is just fascinating to me to see over the decades how now Suicide Squad is this world-known movie franchise and that Peacemaker is now going to have his own series. Right. You know, this, this character that initially started, I believe he was created by uh, Pat Boyette over at Charlton, and then the character was moved to D.C., and then he first appeared in, I, I drew him when he first appeared in Suicide, Suicide Squad. Squad. And now th to have that kind of be a thing, like, you know, the first appearance of Peacemaker in Suicide right. Squad, yes. I had no idea that that would ever be something. But what was real neat was, uh, was recently, um, when the movie was getting ready to come out, DC had a month of uh, variant covers uh, based on the way they look in the movie. So I revisited, um, uh, you know, the, the squad for a, a, double, a double cover. And it was here. I am drawing Peacemaker again in 2021. Except, you know, instead of you know the uh, this this older character, uh, you know, it's it's John Cena, you know, as Peacemaker in this you know a James Gunn uh, movie that's you know this huge scope. And it just it's fascinating to see how over and this is continuing to snowball. How many different characters are all getting picked up and made into? various shows now like the same thing has happened with matt wagner yep. with uh grindle they just recently announced that there's going right. to be an eight issue i mean eight issue see what i mean mm -hmm. eight 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 episode series coming from netflix in the future and i believe they're filming that now and that's it's a really exciting period to see again getting back to the modern technology that it's the ability to be able to you know to watch all these characters come to life. I mean, the Suicide Squad movie, the new one from James Gunn, was fantastic. I mean, it was a beautiful movie. It was, and and uh, uh, Gunn's uh, dedication to the spirit of John's uh, writing right, was absolutely. really evident in the movie. So the, the, the fact that he captured, it, it was almost like, it really was a, a tremendous experience to sit in the theater and watch these things that we would draw, these crazy scripts that John would have with Come literally the kitchen the sink yeah. in it. And then you, know, you see this, this beautifully realized vision that Gunn had of, of mirroring you know, that. But, but again, the scope is so far beyond anything you could have imagined you know, okay. from that period. So it's wonderful to see. Okay, John, we're, it's hard to believe, but we're running out of time. Okay. I want you to tell the folks at home uh, how they can learn more about you. I, I know that you're, okay. uh, you, you've got some online presence. Talk about how people can well, learn. Well, I have, uh, well, I'm on, I'm on Instagram, and uh, I uh, have a Facebook page, and I also uh, uh, have a website, johnksnyder.com. And uh, let's see, I, uh, I also am on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where well, I am. Yeah. Yep, you got the website and the Twitter and Instagram. People can find you there. And I just wanted to mention real quick for you that uh, a lot of artists like me to mention that under the right set of circumstances, you're available for commissions when you have time in between the graphic novels sure. and, the, yeah. and the painting, so people can kind yeah, of drop me a line you know if you've that. got something you're interested in. That's you know, I, 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 I'm busy, but right. I can, you know. You might be able to fit you in. <laughs> so, John, I thank you so much for being on the show. I wish you continued success. I absolutely love your work, and I'm just so thrilled of your success that you've had. I've known you for years. You've been a good friend, and uh, it's amazing the the mountains you've climbed since I've known well, you. Well, so, uh, congratulations. <laughs> the mountains we've all climbed. <laughs> yeah, right. All of us out there, we've all been climbing mountains, haven't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but, you know. Congratulations to everyone <laughs> That's right. for being here today, yeah. Yeah. and, and uh, I just uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be on, and it's a pleasure to be, you know, still, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, working alive and, and kicking, alive and, alive and, kicking, kicking and all COVID. that. But I do want to say uh, a special thanks to everybody I've worked with in the past and and present because uh, you know I'm very fortunate and uh, I've been very blessed to to be able to work with such a great group of people, you know, over the years and 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 you know onward and upward sure. and on to the next project excellent so. thank you very much john uh folks that's going to wrap it up here for this episode of cult pop it's so fantastic to be back 
I'm so glad to have you here with us and watching. I remind you, as always, visit the website, www.cultpop.com. Every episode we've ever done is available, and, and you can peruse through, watch an episode, visit uh, the guest's website, and have a lot of fun. We appreciate your visits. Again, thanks so much for being with us. We're going to be bringing you more stuff in the future. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.